Brendan, thank you very much indeed for those kind words. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be back at the Institute speaking in my new role as a, as a former commission official. Um, when I had a, a meeting with President Barroso a few months ago to say that I was going to join the EAS, um, his chef de cabinet came up to me after, afterwards and said, uh, the president would like to offer a drink uh, to honor your leaving the institution. I momentarily thought that I'd misunderstood and he'd fired me. Uh, <laughs> but but it, it, it turned out that indeed uh, I have left the commission, which is for someone who spent 31 years in that institution, something of a break. But that is what the, that is what the EAS means. We're bringing together people from the commission, people from the council secretariat and national diplomats in, in a new structure. But before I, I describe what I'm doing, I, I wanted to recall, uh, I heard Pascal Lamy once say that he described moving from working in a national administration to a European administration to an international uh, administration saying that uh, the national was solid, the European was liquid, and the international was gas. <laughs> um, he, didn't, he didn't say hot air, <laughs> please note. In my own career, I mean, I, I did start in the Department of Foreign Affairs, and I'm very grateful because what little I know of diplomacy, I'm now going to have to dredge back and re remember uh, from my days there. And when I did join the commission, my first boss, Bob Cavon, said to me, oh, you come from the Department of Foreign Affairs, une très bonne école, which was, uh, I think, a justified compliment to, to, to the department for which I'm grateful. But if I look at my own career, I think the most solid thing I did was actually uh, trade, which is uh, a solid competence of the EU. The Commission is the exclusive negotiator, so you don't have bothersome member states getting in your hair. Uh, and uh, it, it is a very concrete and down-to-earth subject matter. You negotiate deals and you get outcomes. Um, so that's the solid. I would say the liquid was probably when I was Secretary General of the Commission, where things are already getting a bit more fluid, uh, you're in more difficult, complex situations. And now I think I have definitely moved into the upper atmosphere uh, of gas, uh, not only because of the nature of the External Action Service, which is a work in progress, but because foreign policy uh, and a common foreign policy and a European foreign policy is very much work in progress. Uh, and uh, I must say there is no lack of actors or people who think that they uh, have the sort of the right answers to all the questions. So I, it is going to be a challenge. And I'm also very pleased that, uh, to a certain extent, there's a, there's a continuity because I was a, a, an alternate member in the convention for, the, for Michel Barnier, who was then the commissioner. Uh, and I followed the development of this idea, firstly, of a double-hatted uh, vice president and high representative. You may remember that I think Chris Patton used to very wittingly, wittily say that uh, things between himself and Javier Solana worked very well because Xavier was the front office, he was the back office, and fortunately the back office no longer had career expectations, which since he went on to be ch Chancellor of uh, Oxford University was not entirely true. But uh, I think it showed that there was already a tension in these two roles of being the high representative and having a commissioner for external relations. And many people felt it was necessary to try and at least integrate the schizophrenia into the head of one person. <laughs> I, d I don't think that we've completely eliminated the schizophrenia, and I'm sure that Kathy Ashton, if she were here, would like to describe to you the, the, the tension of her job, of how she manages to be in the commission, attending summits, negotiating on Iran, solving the Middle East peace problem, uh, all with the same physical constraints of only being in one place at one time. So we haven't completely solved it, but I think we have brought uh, a new order to the structure. And obviously, the logical consequence of creating that role was to look at the support staff for such a person, uh, which is the External Action Service. Because on the one hand, we had the commission with a very substantial uh, external relations uh, armory, both in terms of staff in Brussels and a network of delegations uh, all around the world. And on the other hand, we had what had developed uh, in the council secretariat, which is basically a secretariat, but which had developed under the uh, considerable impetus of, of Javier Solana, who did a fantastic job in this regard, but was slowly developing quasi-executive role in foreign policy with the uh, staff that he had, with the uh, military and civil missions which were there. And I think everyone agreed it would be much more logical to try to bring these two things together uh, under one roof. 
Uh, it may have seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, I hope that it still proves to be a good idea by the time we've actually done it. Um, now, this has started since the Lisbon Treaty came into force. Uh, the first challenge was to get the legal structure in place. Fortunately, uh, I was still just doing trade negotiations, so that was much easier than trying to negotiate uh, this council decision for the establishment. But Cathy Ashton managed, I think, very skillfully to pull things together. And frankly, I was very amazed from outside at how quickly that decision was actually taken. Uh, when we, in December of uh, 2009, the objective was to try and do it within a year, and in fact, they did it uh, in, in July, uh, basically. Uh, this was a considerable achievement, uh, and notwithstanding the, the many difficulties. Now, I'm now charged with trying to bring this to life and, and make it uh, operate, as you, as you say, Brendan, though I fear that the title Chief Operating Officer risks to be the person who's responsible for whatever does not operate rather than what does operate. Um, there are three challenges, I think, that we, that we face particularly in, in, in trying to do this. The first, obviously, is the administrative, the personnel and administrative challenges of uh, building a new structure from the component parts, Commission, Council Secretariat, and Member States, and running our own budget. Secondly, trying to integrate, which is the purpose of the exercise, the different policy instruments, including the, the community instruments, but also the CFSP budget, and the uh, civilian and military missions on the ground, uh, uh, in some kind of common strategy and some kind of common foreign policy uh, which uh, represents the EU's contribution to global challenges in the 21st century. And thirdly, of course, there is the question of adapting to the new institutional and policy-making structure, which is post-Lisbon, with, particularly with the virtual disappearance of the role of a rotating presidency from uh, the foreign policy area. So, let me start with the administrative issues. Uh, we have composed our staff from the Commission, from the Council Secretariat, and from national diplomats. National diplomats will eventually make up one-third of the External Action Service. Now, I am convinced that their skills and contacts will boost our capabilities enormously, and I firmly believe that the blending of the staff will be a source of strength for each, and that Member States will bring skills uh, which are not to be found uh, in the Council Secretariat or, or in the Commission. Of course, Perhaps if I can open a parenthesis, my sense in dealing with the staff over the last uh, two months is that, as always, everyone is inclined to think that they're the ones losing out. My commission colleagues, a number of them, are quite convinced that somehow they have lost out because they now find themselves in what could be a quasi-intergovernmental organization with new layers of hierarchy with member state diplomats coming in and, and taking over. The Council Secretariat colleagues, who worked in a rather light and flexible way, a much smaller institution than the Commission, feel they're being swallowed whole by a giant Commission whale into which they will simply disappear without trace, and they will lose uh, their specific policy, uh, nimble-footed approach which they were able to have in the service of, of, of Mr. Solana uh, in a much more flexible way than the very heavy-handed bureaucratic Commission way. And, of course, Member States are completely convinced that the two institutions are combining to make sure that they will never get any posts of any interest, uh, and that between us the European officials are conspiring to make sure that member state diplomats don't get a fair crack of the whip. So that's pretty much the psychology with which I have to deal on a daily basis, uh, and uh, previous psychological training comes in very handy. The reality, I, I hope, will be very, very different. Uh, Cathy is very clear that this is not going to be a, a cut and paste of the Commission. It is a new structure. We're not a new institution. We're an institution in terms of the financial regulation and in terms of the staff statutes because we need a certain amount of budgetary and personnel autonomy. But we are not a new institution in the treaty sense. We need to be plugged in to, to the Commission, plugged into the Council, and we need to work very closely with the Member States. And having that staff from those three sources will be, will be very valuable. Just to give you some numbers, um, the total number of external action personnel will now stand at 3,645, including uh, nearly 1,600 at headquarters and 2,000 in delegations in 130 countries around the world. 
In addition, we have, and I was very surprised by this number myself, we have over 4,000 people currently deployed in ongoing EU civilian and military crisis management operations around the world. That is quite a, a, a large organization to, to bring together and to manage effectively, though still quite a lot smaller than many of our member states' diplomatic services. But. Um, obviously, one of the challenges in this is that of organizational culture. We inherit uh, a commission way of doing things, a uh, council secretariat way of doing things, and of course national diplomats bring their perception of how a good administration should function. It is obviously going to take us a certain amount of time to build a common corporate identity, and as Cathy would wish us to do, to have a, a modern, forward-looking, uh, flexible uh, uh, organization, which again does not try to emulate national diplomatic services, many of whom have traditions going back hundreds of years. We can't, we can't invent that. But we need to build on the best of that and at the same time create something which is distinctively European and which adds value relative to what individual member states can do. Um, one challenge for us is simply to administer ourselves. Isn't that the biggest challenge of any organization? Uh, we take over a lot of functions which previously would have been done for us by the administration of the commission or done for us by the administration of the council. <laughs> Um, my people tell me, but they would, wouldn't they, but they're probably right, that in the transfer we didn't get as many of those staff as we would have wished. So we're going to have to see how we can still perform those functions for our staff with, with less resources. We have designed service level agreements with the Commission and the Council <coughs> Secretariat to continue many of the functions. So one of my big challenges was to make sure that people could still send their children to the creche, that they could still, that the salaries would get paid. Believe me, this was... Uh, 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 at risk at one point uh, in the closing stages of the year, uh, and to make sure that all the, 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 the multitude of services which a, a, an employer has to provide to their staff, that we could, we could continue to guarantee this, even though we did not, as, a, as EAS, have the capacity to deliver these services. And I must say, I'm very grateful to the Council Secretariat and to the Commission. They've been extremely cooperative. People have worked very hard. And by and large, all of this is functioning, even if we have some hiccups here and there. And uh, so we still have some bugs to iron out, not least in the, the IT structure. So that then takes me to the question of the instruments. What are we going to be managing? Um, I think the key challenge was to do what people asked us to, which was now to bring these, all of these together in a rather more integrated way. Now, of course... Uh, a very good idea, but there are constraints because there are still community instruments which have their logic. There is still CFSP budget which has its logic. We have the missions which are involving military where spending comes from member states. So we haven't, with one wave of a wand, suddenly brought all this together. What we do have is we have a single structure to try to manage these uh, different instruments in a much more integrated way. And the challenge will be to demonstrate that, that we can do that slightly better uh, than was done before. We do have a further complication, which is that the treaty says only the Commission can implement the budget. So we can advise, uh, we can program, we can give the strategic direction, uh, we can dictate the policy objectives, but at the end of the day it will come back to the Commission services to implement the budget. So we actually will have co-located with us in our building <laughs> a sort of annex of the Commission called the Financial Foreign Policy Instruments Service. I'm not going to use the acronym which results from it. Um, and which will be responsible for implementing the budget uh, on our behalf for, under the political guidance of, of Cathy Ashton. Equally in the delegations, even though all of the delegations have been transformed from the 1st of December into EU delegations. The fact is, around two-thirds of the people working in the delegations will continue to be commission staff, not external action service staff. This gives rise, in the first instance, I have to say, to actually making life in delegations slightly more complicated than it was before, because heads of delegation have to manage two separate uh, financial circuits and two separate sort of uh, cadre of, of staff. But this was uh, a, a, an unavoidable consequence of uh, uh, creating this new service while at the same time respecting the treaty prerogatives of, of the Commission as being responsible for the implementation of the budget. 
The other area where we need to look at is, of course, the whole question of the uh, synergy with the uh, military and civilian mission side of things, which is, I must say, extremely impressive, what I have seen uh, and what they have done with relatively small numbers of staff, and how, while fully respecting the intergovernmental nature of that, we nonetheless try to get a, a sort of seamless connection between the three things that Cathy puts a lot of emphasis on. One is crisis prevention. In other words, what do you do upstream to avoid situations turning into a crisis? Secondly, crisis management, crisis response. How do you deal with when, in spite of all that, something does go wrong, or because of a natural disaster or a political disaster, it goes wrong? How do we then, as EU, react? You can look at Haiti, you can look at other situations. And uh, post-crisis reconstruction. When the crisis is over, how do you then help people rebuild and put things back together again? And how do you get, uh, using the, the, the range of instruments which are there, financial and other, how do you get uh, a joined up policy of being able to have a consistent EU presence and visibility in undertaking these kind of operations? These, of course, are, if you like, the, the carrots in our policy armory. We also have uh, sticks, uh, the issue of sanctions, for example, uh, which are an essential element in implementing UN security resolutions, as well as other legal instruments designed to fight against torture or trade in blood diamonds, the Kimberley process, and so forth. Um, how we bring all of this together in, a, in an integrated policy and as part of a sort of overall vision of how Europe is interacting with its global partners will be one of the great challenges. Um, the third challenge is about institutional and policy making. Um, a key role for the EAS is to take over the role previously held by the rotating presidency. Now, I worked intensively in the Irish presidency of 1979, so I have some experience of what it's like, even though that was a long time ago, and presidencies have changed since then. And when I was Secretary General, I always used to be struck by the way in which presidency teams, and member states by and large, put a lot of resources into their presidency. This was a big deal, even for big countries and even a bigger deal for medium to uh, smaller countries. And people would work very, very hard and very intensely for six months, knowing that then it ended. And I remember as I was Secretary General, I often used to be struck by, at the end of the December European Council, and there'd be a successful European Council, and everyone would have thanked the presidency, and everyone was in a great mood, and the presidency would come up and say, thank you, and God, we're so tired, and I'm going on holidays, and you're going skiing, I'm going to, going to Egypt, I'm going to Lausanne. And then I would be there, knowing that behind them stood the next presidency, sort of saying, right, when can we start? And how can we, how can we full of energy, can we meet over Christmas? It's very important because we have to be ready on the 1st of January. And sometimes, as a permanent European official, you got a bit tired. You say, do we actually get to take a break in this process? The EAS is now the permanent presidency. I mean, we are it. That's, that's it, whether it is the Foreign Affairs Council for Cathy personally, whether it is the uh, PSC, where, where we will have an EAS uh, ambassador chairing it, uh, whether we will chair the working groups, and the backup to all of this now has to come from within our staff resources, and it's not a sprint for a presidency, it's a marathon for the EAS. And we have to demonstrate that we're capable of doing that as well as presidencies did with that burst of, of six months of energy, Red Bull uh, or, or otherwise stimulated, uh, with which they would then, you know, burst in, do a great job and run out again to be replaced by another team of fresh, energetic people. Uh, but we have to try and manage to be as energetic and somehow pace ourselves to do that over, over the long haul. And this is going to be, I think, quite a challenge, frankly. Uh, uh, but this is uh, a big change. Um, it has presented some challenges. I think one of the great successes has been the transition for our delegations in third countries. That was immediate. It's taken us some time to set up the EAS uh, in Brussels, but the delegations, it was a, a switch on and off. Overnight, the Commission delegation became the EU delegation. And my experience traveling around the world, even in my former capacity of trade, is that that went extremely well. And I think that is the view shared by, by uh, in third country capitals. I've spoken to many uh, uh, government officials in, in Washington, in, in, in Beijing and elsewhere, and they all say this has worked remarkably well. And it's a tribute, obviously I will say this, to the, to the staff of those delegations, the EU staff, who were sufficiently able and skilled 
to make this work, but frankly also, and just as importantly, a huge tribute to the goodwill shown by member states and by member state ambassadors in Washington, in Beijing, in Tokyo, and in, in, in all the capitals, where people rallied round, said, yes, this is a new world. <coughs> now we have an EU delegation. The, the, the head of the EU delegation chairs the coordination meetings. Démarches are made by the head of the EU delegation. And I must say there's been a wonderful collaboration. We've had some still have one or two hiccups and bugs to sort out in certain parts of the world. Uh, but by and large, this has been a great success. Uh, and this, I think, has done a huge positive thing for our image worldwide. We have a situation which is different in New York, where paradoxically, uh, Lisbon actually took us backwards. Because, because the rotating presidency, which of course, as a member state, and as a, as a country, as a nation, had a seat in the UN and could speak, suddenly it's the EU uh, delegation, which is actually an observer, and doesn't really have the right to speak. So we actually went for, to a situation of less profile. We tried to correct this by having a, a resolution uh, adopted last year, which would have changed the situation and allowed exceptionally for the EU to have slightly different rules than apply to other delegations, and we lost the vote. So not a great policy success for the, for the EAS. We lost it, frankly, because we didn't uh, take enough time to explain, we didn't take enough time to uh, lobby and to explain to people, and I think there was a huge amount of confusion. We are now going to rerun the vote. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> uh, we're going to rerun the vote, and we're going to get it right this time. Uh, but we are hugely investing in lobbying, explaining, talking to people, building up alliances, and I think we will be able to get that through in due course and correct the situation. In the meantime, New York represents a, a little bit of an, an anomaly to the, to the new situation. So this is what we are, we are trying to do. Now, when I was Secretary General of the Commission and we were doing the reforms with Neil Kinnock and Romano Prodi, there was a joke I used to tell, which I'm reminded of now. It was the, the doctor who drives in with a very sophisticated car to the garage, heart surgeon, and the mechanic says, uh, doctor, let me show you something. He opens up the bonnet of the car and he says, look at this magnificent machine, all this complicated machinery. He said, I work with this and I fix it and I make it work. That's just as skilled as your open heart surgery. And the heart said, yes, yes. He said, try doing it with the engine running. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, unfortunately, we're forced to build the EAS with the engine running. Uh, we, can't, you know, we can't press a pause button on international events and say, hold on, give us six months, we'll sort ourselves out and then we'll come back. Uh, so we're trying to create this new structure while at the same time responding on an almost daily basis to, to the policy challenges. And this is, this is in itself extremely challenging. Let me just give you, because I don't want to give the impression that I'm completely obsessed with how we organize ourselves, let me just give you a glimpse of, of what we see as, the, as Cathy sees as the major policy objectives to which this new instrument will now be bent. First and foremost, uh, building stability and prosperity in the neighborhood. The whole issue of neighborhood policy, uh, uh, obviously in the Western Balkans uh, and, else, and of course on the, the Southern Mediterranean Rim, you will need to look at what's happening in, in Tunisia to understand that this is, this is an area of primary importance for, for, for the EU. Secondly, advancing the Middle East peace process. Uh, not going so well just at the moment, uh, but uh, obviously a major challenge to which we are 100% committed, and, and Kathy is a, an active, she was in the Middle East last week, uh, and this is clearly a high priority. Thirdly, engaging with strategic partners. You know the European Council had a debate on this issue. Uh, how do we, as the EU, as 27 European countries, project ourselves in our relations with China, with Russia, uh, with India, with Japan, where we have, frankly, a very developed trade and economic relationship and an extremely underdeveloped strategic and political relationship. And this is, in many ways, probably our biggest challenge as the EU in the 21st century. We are an economic giant. We are the largest economy in the world. I'm not going to do the opposite of a giant to say that that's what we are in political terms, but it's clear that we have not yet found ways of being able to act as EU which is commensurate with our economic and trading strength uh, in order to be a force for good uh, in, in the world. And I think that is probably our single biggest challenge in policy terms. Finally, of course, promoting human rights and good governance. Uh, these are the silver threads that run through what we do, the promotion of, of defense of human rights, the promotion of democracy, good governance. This should run through everything that, that we do. And of course, um, 
what Pierre de Boissieu used to, used to somewhat impolitely call in relation to European Councils, l'idiocie du jour. Um, but we, we are faced on a daily basis with ongoing crisis. One of the things that strikes me uh, since I've been doing this job is you know, how the phone rings, uh, you get text messages at night all through the day that the situation in Ivory Coast, the situation in Tunisia, the situation in, in different parts of the world, and we are required to react. We are required to respond, uh, either in diplomatic terms, in terms of issuing a statement, or factly also in terms of uh, coordinating with member states on how we might protect the interests of European civilians uh, or, or diplomatic missions uh, present uh, uh, on, on the ground. This is a huge challenge, uh, one which should not distract us, of course, from the strategic view, but which does require a daily response uh, and where the, the, the mechanisms uh, and the structures, I know Cathy wants to reinforce that, so we have a much better capacity to respond to uh, crises. So that is all I want to say. Uh, this is a fascinating challenge. Um, I, I really do see it as an adventure. It's not very often as a, as a European public servant you actually get the chance, as you said, Brendan, to be in at the creation of something completely new. This is not completely new because it's building on what is there, but it is the creation of something which I believe has the potential significantly to reinforce our capacity to have an EU presence globally in the 21st century. Of course, it will depend entirely on the willingness of member states to go in that direction. The EAS can provide the framework, we can provide the leadership, we can provide the sense of direction. The question will always be, do member states want to go there? And we know that the answer is yes, probably, uh, yes, sort of. Uh, and that's going to be the challenge of how we firm up the yes uh, to, to, as an answer to more of those questions and soften down a bit the, the, the sort of. Uh, great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, I, I hope you get some sense of, of this challenge which Cathy has taken upon herself and which we will try to deliver for her on. Uh, and if you like, I'll come back in, in a year's time and we can see where we got to. Thank you very much indeed.